Now carrying on with capillary pathophysiology, this is the normal state of affairs here. Fluid being formed at the arterial end, being reabsorbed at the venous end and with a pressure change, as we saw in the previous uh, video clip. Now what I want to look at now is the situation where there is a hypoproteinemia. So hypo protein emia. Hypo low protein is the protein and uh, emia if you're English you put an A if you're American. US spelling doesn't have an A. Hypoproteinemia. This could be a, a generalized hypoproteinemia as you would get in malnutrition, or there could be a hypoalbuminemia because the liver is not synthesizing the albumin. But for whatever reason, there are low amounts of protein in the blood. Now, normally, there's supposed to be the right amount of protein in the blood because that's what gives rise to the oncotic pressure to facilitate the reabsorption. But if someone is not getting enough protein to eat, then their liver cannot synthesize the albumin. If someone's got not getting enough protein to eat, their lymphocytes, their B lymphocytes, cannot stimulate or cannot synthesize the immunoglobulins. That's of course why people become um, immunosuppressed if they're malnourished. If they have not got the amino acids to make the antibodies, how can the um, B lymphocytes make the antibodies? They can for a while because they can break down protein, but basically malnutrition leads to immunocompromise. And if someone's malnourished, there's no amino acids going to the liver. And it's the liver that makes the albumin. So we're short of albumin. Should be there, but we're short of it. We've got low levels of protein in the blood. Now, what this means is that the pressures are the same, but now can you see the osmotic pressure has been reduced? So it should be up there, but now it's down here. So that means there's greater filtration pressures basically all the way along here. So in the normal situation, it's only the first half of the capillary where there's filtration and the second half is reabsorption. But now the hydrostatic pressure is going to be greater than the oncotic pressure for much more of the length of the capillary. That means we're going to increase the amount of tissue fluid. We're going to become soggy. This is edema. In England we say edema with an O. So we become soggy. There's too much tissue fluid. So you've seen these appalling pictures of children with blown up tummies who are malnourished in famine situations. Because there's a huge vasculature, there's huge capillary beds in the mesentery. And the fluid will drain into the, um, or the fluid will accumulate in the peritoneal cavity. Because there's more fluid being formed because of the greater differentiation between the hydrostatic and the oncotic pressure, but less is being reabsorbed. So here there's less, there's some being reabsorbed there, but it's less than we would not like in the normal physiological situation. And we get these appalling pictures of children with blown up tummies. The, the, the fluid actually goes with gravity really, so they get blown up ankles, puffy eyelids, um, edematous scrotums. And the treatment, of course, is to give them some protein, because if we feed them protein, if we do that correctly, the gastrointestinal tract can break that down into amino acids. The amino acids can be absorbed into the blood. 
they'll go to the liver and the liver is perfectly capable of synthesizing the albumin which will restore the oncotic pressure of the blood and will reverse the accumulation of excessive tissue fluids and of course we get a similar situation if we give too much uh, water in fluid overload Now this can happen if someone drinks too much, some psychiatric patients will drink too much. I think you call that polydipsia. Or we could give too much intravenous fluid, which is quite easy to do, especially in children. Remember, children have very low blood volumes and it's very easy to over infuse. That's why we're always ultra careful not to give children too much intravenous fluid. But if you get too much intravenous fluid, then the water, I think, again, you can see the water there is going to dehydrate, the water is going to, sorry, the water is going to over dilute. The excessive amount of water is going to over dilute the plasma proteins. And that means for a given volume of blood, you've got less oncotic pressure sucking back in. That means fluid can accumulate in the tissues. And if we give too much intravenous fluid, this iatrogenic condition of fluid overload, we can see the eyelids uh, under the, they get bags under the eyes that become puffy. But the main, the main thing to look out for is the pulmonary edema. The patient will be orthopnic. They'll have orthopnia. Difficulty in breathing when lying down. That's often the first thing that you see. So we need to sit these patients up. We need to stop the intravenous fluid and we need to consider giving them diuretics. Of course, in uh, malnutrition, we wouldn't give diuretics. We need to give protein. So the effect is the same there. We get lowering of the osmotic pressure in the blood. So we've seen that this simple physiology accounts for um, adaptation during periods of fluid loss, such as sweating or diarrhea and vomiting. It's uh, life-saving after hemorrhage. And it also explains why we get edema in hyperproteinemia and fluid overload. So they're all variations of this basic normal physiology. But hopefully in you at the moment, this is what's going on. We're getting the formation and we're getting the reabsorption of the interstitial fluid bathing all the body cells, acting as the transport medium for everything that's going to and from the cells. But I think as we see now being maintained in a dynamic way, with the potential to go wrong, giving rise to pathophysiological changes, the pathophysiological changes will give rise to clinical features, which we learn to recognise so we can assess the patient, diagnose the condition and treat them accordingly.